Good morning. I hope that you uh, have a smartphone that you wake up to nowadays. If not, you might not even be tuning in this morning since we had that time change. Um, just wanted to let everybody know, looking forward to us being able to get back together for church. Amen. And uh, we will be doing that. Not uh, Well, obviously not today, not Wednesday either, but next Sunday we'll be getting back together in church. Amen. I hope you're looking forward to it also. Um, I've been enjoying these little uh, sessions. I do believe that the Wednesday night session was a little too long. Uh, I think 35 minutes or so is a good time frame for these virtual encounters. And so that's what we're going to try to keep it to this morning. We're going to be talking this morning on the subject of peace. Uh, that's really what I titled it, simply peace this morning. But let's go ahead and pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you in prayer this morning. We want to thank you, Lord. That, Father, that you have such a beautiful plan. You have a plan of peace for this earth. It was the Prince of Peace. You sent him to us. And the Word of God teaches us about the gospel of peace. It teaches us how to walk in your ways, O oh Lord God. The world is looking for peace. They want harmony between nations. They want peace between because of racial divide and all of the things that take place that cause chaos. But we understand, I understand, Lord, that true peace comes from you comes from you being on the inside of your creation's heart and you begin to produce peace, Lord. And so we pray, Lord God, that the peace of God would, would begin to envelop this world, Lord God. We look forward to your return. We look forward to the fact that you will one day, as the Prince of Peace, rule and reign upon this earth. We just give you glory and honor. Lord, I'll lift up the president to you. I'll lift up his cabinet. I'll lift up the campaign, Lord God. I lift up. Lord, this nation. And I pray, Lord God, that your will would be done, O oh Lord. I pray that your will would be done through this election cycle. Lord God, I just want to give you glory and honor. Lord, I thank you for being an American. I was born in America. I've been to other countries, and I'm grateful, Lord, that I was born in this nation. Young people nowadays can say whatever they want to say, Lord, but I've been to Mexico. I've been to Asia. I've been to other places, and I know for a fact that this is. I've been to Europe. This is the greatest country on earth, and I thank you. For, for allowing this country to be in existence. And I pray, Lord God, that you would protect the foundation of, of what this country was built upon. Lord, I know it's far from perfect, but Lord, nevertheless, you allowed this country to be created, I believe, most of all, for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be able to go forward into this, into this fallen world. So let's get, to, let's get down to it. The, the, the concept of peace and the topic of peace if you look up in the in the Greek dictionary in the New Testament, the word peace it has a couple of different meanings. One is to set at one again, or bringing back together that which was separated. So the idea there, whenever we're talking about peace between people, peace between nations, the idea is harmony, harmony between two entities or more than two entities, and uh, and then also the idea of peace or quietness and rest. You know, I was thinking about whenever Jesus was walking on the waters and then Peter came out to him and how at that time the waves were very contrary and the, and the winds were very violent. It, it, if you look into the Greek word and what it talks about with those winds, it describes them as it's a squall or a tempest, but it describes a violent attack of, of the waves and the wind. But Jesus said, peace, be still, and those winds and that storm, they listened to him. And that's really where I kind of wanted to start this teaching was to, to create the idea, or not create the idea, but to, to bring forth the idea that in order for anyone to have any desire for peace, then many times it has to be preceded by chaos. It has to be preceded by turmoil. Because of the fallen nature of man, because of the fallen nature of this earth, and the free will that man has been given, he has a natural proclivity or a natural tendency, if you will, to go towards things that are not God's will for our lives. We don't have time to get into the theological, philosophical discussion on why God would do that. It's because of love, and it's because of the fact that He created us with a free will so that we would freely choose Him. But that free will is in a fallen state because of the fall of Adam and the fact that we come from Him. And so that's where we start. We start in a fallen place where mankind has a tendency to desire to go in his own direction. And when he does that, 
It results in a lack of peace. The antonym of peace would be frustration and chaos and an unsettledness in the spirit. I think that we can all agree, you know, I can remember back when I used to go to the jail and minister over there, and I would tell them, we may not have Jesus in common right now, but we all have this in common. And what we all have in common as human beings is that we were born of Adam, we were born in sin, and I guarantee you, in some way, shape, or form, we have all experienced on this sin-riddled earth the concept of a lack of peace, of an unsettled feeling in our spirit, man, of uh, of chaos instead of rest. Take a look with me at Genesis chapter 3, verse 13. It says in this scripture, it says, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Whenever you look at that word beguiled, it or it really it what it describes is to be deluded. Ultimately, to be deluded means to be deceived. And when I think of how the serpent, yes, it, that describes an animal, but really what we're talking about here is the manifestation of how Satan presented himself to the first couple. And the word Satan, I looked at looked up the word Satan and the word devil. So Satan means a poser and one who circumvents through deception. So in other words, his whole point in opposing God and opposing man is to prevent man from getting back to God. So now that he's calling, caused the man to, be, to exist within this fallen state of the earth and also of his nature, now he desires, his whole plan, big part of his plan is to create really a lack of peace in any way, shape, or form he can, any kind of lack of peace upon this earth, between nations, between neighborhoods, between races, however he can cause a lack of peace, that is going to be his will. But as the as the as Satan or the opposer, he specifically circumvents, which means to to cause one to to avoid one from making it to the destination where they're intended to go. So a uh, circumventing through deception. So he presents a false pathway. We could get into, I don't want to, but we could get into all the false religions, all the creation of false religions that the enemy has made. Buddha is not the right way. Uh, Allah is not the right way. You know, and people get so frustrated nowadays when you say that. But no, he is the opposer. He is the opposer through deception and he is opposing the way of God and the will of God. He's opposing the word of God, which speaks to the heart of man and says, this is the right way for you to travel so that you will not be circumvented so that instead you can come back to me. But it also means peace also means quietness and rest. There you go. That's a, that's again, the description or the, and the, the opposite really of that whole storm scenario that I told you about when Peter was in the midst of that storm. There was no quiet. There was no rest. Everything was turbulent and tempestuous. So Satan is the opposer. Satan is the devil. Now let's take another look at, at the Genesis narrative where we're creating this picture or, or preparing this picture of a lack of peace. It says in Genesis chapter 3 verse 17, we're just going to scroll up a little bit. It says, Unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So verse 18 says, It says, Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. It goes on to say that in the sweat of your face, you shall eat your bread. So what we're talking about here is great toil and labor. Listen, we understand the Bible is very explicit. We're supposed to work. We're supposed to earn our keep. But listen to the contradiction, the way that the earth is against man now. Because it, it created through this fallen nature or the curse that has been placed upon the earth. The Bible says in Romans 8 that all creation groans. Waiting for the redemption of the sons of man. What, it, what does that mean? It's describing the day when we will be fully redeemed. Yes, our souls, our hearts can be redeemed by Jesus now through the shedding of his blood. But there's coming a day when, all, when the redemption will be final. And that when that takes place, also the creation will be redeemed. 
But right now it's in a fallen state just like man. And it produces thorns and thistles. If you can imagine reaching down, you know, I'm, you, I, I'm just using some a, a picturesque moment to try to describe something, the beauty of a rose. You reach down and you grab that rose. And what happens? You grab a hold of thorns. And, and, and it causes pain. And it causes heartache. And, and so truthfully, whenever we think of that, we, we, we think, what a beautiful picture. It, it would maybe even denote or give the idea of peace and tranquility. Because it's a beautiful creation. But then when you reach down there and you grab it and, you, and the thorn is driven into your finger, it results in pain. It results in chaos. It results in a level of stress. And thorns and thistles are, are a deterrent to farming and to harvest. And mankind takes its food from the earth. And the earth, in a sense, is against them because of its fallen ways. And you can, we don't have to just talk about a growing a crop, but we can talk about life in general and how we go through life and we find ourselves in these circumstances and situations where the thorns and the thistles are against us. Even in the parable of the sower, the, the, the sower goes out to sow. It's originally talking about Jesus being the sower, but also the word of God is the seed that is being sown. When it falls in the ground where the thorns grow, what does it do? The thorns rise up on the side of it and wrap around it and choke the life out of it. And so the thorns are the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches. Many times the cares of the world... Once again, the pain, the chaos, the lack of peace, grab a hold of the heart. Mankind tries to find different ways to try to bring tranquility to his spirit man, to his soul. But he brings all the wrong stuff in. And when he does that, he creates an even bigger mess because he's go the enemy has just found another way to circumvent him from going to the right direction, which is going to Jesus. But I got to tell you that God's will is peace. Amen. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 1 verse 78 and 79 and I just want to I just want to tell you that God's will is peace for this earth. It's not going to it's not happening all at once. He's allowing it to progressively take place. He's got a plan in place and you're not going to see it all I'm not going to see it all at once. But if we will hold on to Jesus, I'm here to tell you right now, if we will hold on to the plan of the Father. We will see the peace that he has planned for this earth, amen, and for our lives. So God's will is peace. And if we read verse Luke chapter 1, verse 78 and 79, it says, Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us, verse 79, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Now, I got to tell you that what this is talking about right here, who's talking is Zacharias, John the Baptist's father. If you study theology in, uh, of the Bible, you, you come across a concept known as the spirit of prophecy. And the spirit of prophecy has been alive from the time that God just proclaimed in the garden that the earth will, the earth will produce thorn and thistle that the serpent will slither on his belly, that the seed of the woman will crush his head and that his head will bruise it, the seed of the woman's heel. Though that's all having to do with the spirit of prophecy, telling us the result of sin, telling us the remedy to sin. And, but, and, and through the ages, God creating, God speaking through Abraham, God speaking through David, God creating Israel, speaking through Israel, God giving us Jesus and speaking through Jesus through all the prophets during the time frame of the kings, the spirit of prophecy, which was silence for approximately 400 years doing what is known during the time frame known as the intertestamental period. From the time of Malachi to the time of Zacharias when he was first did not believe the word of the angel and his mouth was shut until the time that he opened his mouth and began to speak this right here. The spirit of prophecy came back. And this is what he said. He said the day spring. That's talking about a dawn. A dawn in the midst of darkness. It began, to, it began to show. It began to cast light upon the darkness. And what it did was to guide our feet in the way of peace. I'm here to tell you the good news of the gospel is that God has a plan for peace for this earth. And he has a plan of peace for your life. Look at Luke chapter 2. 
Luke chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. We're coming off of the heels of Zacharias saying, hey, this is a prophecy. And he was talking about Jesus. He was talking about the child Jesus being born to Mary. And that, um, I'm sorry, he was talking about, the, about John the Baptist, his son, preparing the way for the child Jesus to come. And that the child Jesus would be this day spring, the promise that the Father had given us. In, in Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, we're talking about God's plan for peace. It says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising. We're talking about angels that showed up in the field with the shepherds. Host and praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill, towards men. Again, God's will and plan for man's life is that you and I would experience peace. And I have to tell you that if we're not experiencing peace in our lives, it's not because it's God's fault. The whole fall of man is not God's fault. God gave man a choice. God, man chose to go another way. And now being born in Adam, there's a lack of peace on the earth. But each and every one of us make choices in our own lives that cause us to go down a pathway that results in a lack of peace instead of a place of peace. Look at Romans chapter 15, verses, verse 33. Romans 15, verse 33. Look, what I, I wanted you to know that he is the God of peace. It says, now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And if we go down to Romans 16, verse 20, look what it says. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So I wanted you to see that he is the God of peace. Amen. He's known as the God of peace. And that, that the God of peace will crush the enemy on our behalf through Jesus Christ. Through the grace that is given to us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. I definitely believe that Paul is alluding back to the Genesis narrative that I just read to you. Where it says that the serpent's head would be crushed under the foot of under the heel of the seed of the woman. Which is we know to be Jesus. And, and that's what he's talking about. But not only that, listen, also for our lives. You, you maybe have never experienced peace in your life. There's a good chance you could be a believer out there. And you've been living for God or going to church and you truly could be saved and have not really experienced the level of peace in your life that God has for you because of a lack of understanding of the gospel, because of a lack of, of the Holy Spirit moving upon your heart. A lot of times it's because we're not sitting under sound doctrine, sound teaching of the word of God. And we're being told to put our faith in a gospel or a message that is not even really a right interpretation of the scripture. Listen, I had an old professor at Southwestern Assembly of God University, Dr. John Wyckoff, and this is what he claimed, and it was it re resonated in my spirit. If a preacher teaches the word of God in error, it doesn't matter whether he does it on accident or on purpose. The result is the same. It leads to bondage instead of freedom. The word of God must be taught and interpreted properly so that we can put our faith in it. If somebody teaches you, oh, you don't need to understand the Bible, the word doctrine is a bad word, I'm here to tell you, you need to run from that. Because a right understanding of the word of God will give you the right object to where to place your faith. And when your place is, faith is properly placed in the right object, grace will flow. And that's what that word talks about right there. It's an introduction of a new word. We're about to get into grace here in a second. But, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. Just as the prophecy, the spirit of prophecy spoke in the garden after the fall, that the seed of the woman, which is Jesus, would bruise the head of Satan. The word of God is teaching us through the letter that Paul wrote to the Roman church that, the, that faith in the very gospel of Jesus Christ, faith in the, in, the God, in the God of peace, would allow Satan to be crushed under our feet through the grace that is supplied to us through which, what Jesus has already done. That's what he's talking about. Look at this in Romans chapter 10, verse 5, because I want to tell you something also. I want to tell you that it's a gospel of peace. Amen? Romans 10, 
15, it says, How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things to come. The word of God, the whole of the word of God, is the gospel of peace. Because it all is pointing mankind in the Old Testament towards when Messiah would come, in the New Testament, bringing us back to the fact that Messiah has come and the end result of his, of his journey, the end result of, of the work that he had to do according to the Father's will was to die on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin so that we could receive righteousness from him and in that state of righteousness receive a flow of grace into our lives that would empower us and strengthen us. Amen. And where there is grace, there is peace. That's the next thought I want to bring you about the word peace. Peaceful greetings. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 with me real quick. And I'm just really desiring to use this to show you how Paul in his letters would write, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that he, he greets these churches this way in all these different letters. First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. This is the peaceful greeting that he gives the churches. Grace and peace. Now, I've taught this many a times. I don't think this is not just an accident. This is just not a simple salutation that we should peruse over and not pay attention to. No. See, where there's grace flowing, there's peace being received. It's the grace that is given by the Holy Spirit. And the result is peace in the life. Amen. You know, I can remember when, whenever I was young, uh, my mom used to wake me up this way. She would, and I'm not going to sing it, but she would sing this little song and it would say, Good morning, Mary, sunshine, what makes you wake so soon? You used to wake at 10 o'clock, now you wake at noon. Now, I didn't understand really what my mom was doing, and I've never even had a conversation with her about it. But when I thought backwards about that, how she would wake me up that way, and then afterwards, like when I was in the oil field, I can remember being on a job one time, the supervisor came in there, we were all sleeping in bunks, there was probably 12 of us in a room, he flips the light on, he's like, wake up hand, the sun's shining and the grease is waiting for you on the deck. And I can remember feeling how... And he did it every day for about 30 days. I'm like, dude, you talk about waking up with a bunch of turmoil already in your spirit, right? A lack of peace, frustration, like I'm really hating this situation. And I know now what my mom was trying to do. She was trying to wake me up to start the day off with a little bit of peace in my life. I don't remember exactly the lack of peace, but I know it was there. You know what's interesting to me too is, is that just yesterday, at two different times, both of my daughters were here. For whatever reason, there was some conversations that where there was some voices being raised. I mean, it wasn't all fighting. One was maybe a little bit of a fight. But the point being is that voices were being raised and I was watching the dog. And she was like so concerned about what was going on because I guess she's not really used to a whole lot of voices being raised. And... I could tell it was creating a lack, I mean, you could say it almost like a lack of peace. And once again, we're going into that whole, but what Paul is, the main point I wanted to make with my little illustration was a peaceful greeting, grace and peace unto you. And the apostle Paul it, utilized that phraseology in multiple of his letters because he wants you and I to know as believers that where the grace of God is flowing it results in peace. Let's get into that a little bit more, but let's look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, many of you that have been coming to the church for, you know, you are you should already understand what the word justified means. There's a difference between the word, a little bit of a difference between the word justified and the word righteousness. In the Greek language, they're spelled almost exactly the same. But where righteousness describes a new position given to man, 
Okay. Your first position, born of Adam, was that you were born under the plague of sin. That That's the Bible. That's what it teaches. Your first position was that you were guilty because you were born in sin in Adam. But when you became born again, what the Bible teaches is that you now were born again into a state of righteousness because you were clothed with righteousness because the Father willing to give you that state of righteousness based upon what Jesus did. So it's not your righteousness, it's not my righteousness, it's Jesus' righteousness given to us as a gift simply, it might seem too good to be true, but this is the gospel, simply because you chose to put your faith in Jesus and what he did for you at the cross and that the great exchange took place. He took your guilt and you were given his righteousness. That is the hardest thing for mankind to come to grips with. That, that that simple message right there, that God would love the world so much that he would send his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. The simple gift of righteousness that Jesus purchased for us through the shedding of his blood and the giving of his life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, so the new position that you've been given when you died with Christ, were buried with him, and now have been resurrected to newness of life, you now have a new position where you're seated in Christ, you're clothed with him, and now the Father sees you as righteous. That is your position. But listen, what the word justified means is a declaration by God. That's what the word justified means. And what God is declaring is righteous. When you've been justified by faith, God the Father is saying you're righteous. I don't care what your mama said. I don't care what your ex-girlfriend said. I don't care what your preacher might have told you. I don't care what your worst enemy at work told you. I definitely don't care what the devil told you because he's the opposer and the slanderer. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. And what he's saying is, is that you're guilty. And what I'm here to tell you is that that's not the declaration of God. The declaration of God is righteous given to you because you chose to believe his eternal plan that was ultimately to give Jesus in place of your sin. Therefore, being justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. We're talking about peace this morning. Maybe you've been lacking it. I want to tell you how you can get it. Colossians 1 verse 20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Now i got to tell you that part of the context of this scripture is talking about the whole world being at odds with one another. There's other scriptures where it talks about the Jews were against the Gentiles, but now in Christ we've all become one. Any type of form of animosity or chaos or lack of peace, what you and I need to understand is, is that the blood of Jesus has reconciled. That word reconciled is another, it's like really a synonym of peace. Remember the first definition I gave you was to set back together things that were separate. That's what the word reconciliation means. It means to bring two entities back together through the blood of his cross, through the giving of his life. As a sacrifice for sin, what he has done, and those that would be willing to believe that. See, he's already died for every sin of every human being that has ever lived. The, ca the catalyst that changes the position from guilty to righteous, from a declaration of condemnation to a declaration of, of eternal life and freedom is faith. Faith is the hinge point. Faith is the power switch. Faith is the catalyst that brings the change. Those that are unwilling to put faith in the gospel of peace, in the God of peace, in the Prince of Peace, they will never experience the peace of God because they have refused the way of God. But he made peace for us through his blood. Listen, let's take a look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. I want you to see this right here. Because I want you to know that peace is a fruit of the Spirit. So grace, 
Grace is, 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 is the power source or the, the influence. Once again, you know, this was a major revelation for me after I had been a Christian for 12 years. That grace is not just forgiveness. It's very important that you understand that. Grace connected to the daily walk with God is something that is dispensed or given through the person of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's constantly wanting to flow. Just like a satellite unobstructed that sends a signal. And, the, and whoever has the receiver is receiving the signal. The same is the way of grace. Now, things like sin and chaos and confusion and all of those things will try to obstruct the signal flow from the satellite to where the recipient cannot receive what's flowing. But listen, there's unfettered, there should be an unfettered flow of grace that, that, that we have access to because Jesus is the one that provided the access. His work is already completed. That's what he meant when he said it is finished. His work is a completed work. We have to learn to believe that. That is not something that happens overnight. I can tell you that you may even hear it right now. And the Holy Spirit would, would ring that true on the inside of your heart. You would say, that just sounds right it, because it's the truth. But just because it rings true right this moment doesn't mean that the enemy is not going to try to steal that from you. I'm here to tell you that peace is a fruit of the Spirit. So the grace of God is flowing to us because of our faith in the finished work of Christ. Listen, not faith in the fact that he was a great teacher. Not faith in the fact that he performed miracles. I'm, all, those, all those truths are part of who the Christ or the anointed one was, but it was the death that he provided. The efficacy, that's a fancy word we use in medicine, meaning how effective something is. The efficacy of his death is what allows grace to flow because now we're righteous, now we're justified, and because of that, the grace of God can flow into our lives, and where there is grace, there is peace, and Galatians 5.22 says that peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So when grace is flowing in the midst of your life, peace will be produced as a fruit. What you need to understand is you cannot manufacture the peace of God in your life. Man can try to manufacture on this earth peace, but I'm here to tell you, he cannot produce the peace of God. The peace of God is, is so amazing because the situation may not have changed. There could be chaos going all around. Let's look at this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. I love this scripture. I use it a lot. It's an example of the fruit of peace played out in the life. Look at this. Be careful for nothing. You, I know, that's old King James. But what it's really saying there is don't be anxious. Like don't, we should not be walking around in a panic attack. I'm not, I understand that some people deal with anxiety, but listen, that's from the enemy too. God can heal us from that. Don't tell me he can't because he can. He is the healer. All right. And we're not going to get into all the reasons why we might experience that. But listen, if we're moving towards Jesus, I'm telling you right now, he will heal us. It says, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, in other words, your logical mind won't be able to figure it out. It doesn't make any sense why there would be peace. We're talking about the fruit of peace as a result of grace flowing into the light. But the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. you got to keep your heart and your mind stayed on Christ. If you start looking at the winds and the waves and the storms of life, it will get your eyes. If you start looking at the thorns that are wrapping around, the, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the problems that we face on a daily situation, if we allow those things to become bigger than God, then I'm telling you right now, they're going to take our focus off of Jesus. And we're going to interrupt the flow of grace. We're going to put an obstruction between the signal of God, the grace of God flowing into our lives, and we are going to begin to experience a lack of peace, chaos, unsettledness in our spirit. But if we will keep our eyes and heart focused on the Lord, 
we will receive a peace that surpasses understanding and that the Lord will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I want to close with a couple more scriptures, but they're talking about the guidance of peace. I want you to know that God's will is peace on the earth. I want you to know that Jesus provided peace for us when he shed his blood and died in our place. I want you to know that peace is a fruit that is produced through the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I want you to also know in closing that peace will guide us. Look at Colossians 3 verse 15. Colossians 3 verse 15. It says right here, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. You know, I think that I mentioned this Wednesday night when I was teaching about this scripture right here. Because if you look at that first phrase before, if you're looking on your Bible, or if you look at this phrase right here, right before the comma, and let the peace of God rule in your heart. Look at that word rule right there. That word rule really is literally interpreted in the Greek as umpire. And I talked about the fact that they have, in the Greek games, they would have had umpires that called the rules and let you know when you're in the right boundaries. And so what this scripture is really saying is, is that if you will let the peace of God be the umpire in your life, he will lead and guide you in the right direction. Truth be told, if you and I begin to venture off the right path, I'm telling you right now, the Holy Spirit wants to give us direction. And he will many times begin to allow us to feel something negative when we begin to veer off the course. But if we ignore that, I'm telling you right now, Paul told Timothy that people's conscience can become seared as with a hot iron. And we start to ignore the prompts of the Holy Spirit and we start to walk outside of God's will, the peace of God will not play the umpire in our hearts and lives because we will have deadened that area of our spirit man from this leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. So let the peace of God be the umpire in your heart as you're making choices and you're walking through life. Last scripture I want to use is out of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15 says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What's that, what that describing is that's what your shoes are. That's what your, that's what your, you know, the protection of your feet. As you're traveling the journey of Christianity upon this fallen earth that grows thorns and thistles and provides a unsettled environment and stressful and chaos place around every corner. That's what it's trying to promote in your life. That's what it's trying to get. It's trying to circumvent you from getting to the right place that God has for you. But you need to shod. You need to put on your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, I didn't look at this word, but let's look at it together. Preparation, the act of preparing, the condition of a person or thing so far forth as prepared, preparedness, readiness. The only way you're going to be prepared in the gospel of peace is to begin to open up the book, to put your eyes on the scriptures, to allow your ears to hear someone speak the truth to you. I want to remind you of something that I said earlier in this message. If you are sitting under a teaching that is in error, it does not matter. Listen, they might be well-meaning. It doesn't matter whether they're well-meaning. It doesn't matter whether they're doing it on purpose or accident. The result will be that error leads to bondage. Bondage leads to a lack of peace. Truth is the gospel of peace, the way of peace, and will lead and guide you in the right direction. So look, let's do something together. Let's quit blaming God if we feel like we have unsettledness in our spirit. Let's quit blaming the word of God and let's start realizing that it's one of two things. Either number one, we don't properly understand the word of God.
to know where to keep our faith so that we would be traveling in the direction of peace? Or number two, we know it. We just refuse to surrender to it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel of peace. We thank you that you are the God of peace. Lord, I pray that every seed that was planted through this message would find its home in good soil and that it would sprout up on the inside of all of our spirits and that we, O Lord, would listen to the peace that you desire to give to us to lead and guide us in the right direction and that when we're going there or we are there that we would be able to experience the fruit of peace in our life. We thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and giving us access to grace, giving us the position of righteousness that allows grace to flow in our lives and produce peace in our lives. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.